Hello, everybody. Hello, Emma. Thank you so much for coming today. Hey, I'm happy to be here. So, uh, right now we have a conversation with Emma. She is the director of standards at CNN. She has been working for CNN for a decade. She started as a researcher, later as a reporter, and today is one of the, the I think, the youngest uh, person in the team of uh, ethical issues. So, during the pandemic, that is the topic that we have today, she has to take some important decisions. Thank you so much, Emma. Welcome. I'm happy to be here, and um, shout out to all the Outriders folks for making this happen. Um, I mean, it's, they always put on some kind of, I think this is my third um, Outriders fest conference, and there's always something unexpected. I mean, from camels uh, to this fabulous venue, um, and I'm really happy to be here from, uh, from the U.S., from Washington, D.C., um, and to talk about uh, a bit about what it's been like covering the pandemic, um, which of course is, is ongoing, um, and some of the challenges and, and what we've learned. So firstly, tell us how is for a big media like CNN that suddenly a pandemic, something that nobody expected, uh, impacted all the lives in all the countries, but also for media is very difficult. You need to take some decisions, how was this first moment for reporters? You have reporters around the world. How was the first moment for the pandemic? How did you cover it? Yeah, so um, when I was looking back, I mean, gosh, it, I don't know, maybe you guys had this experience too. It was like, um, you know, March, April of 2020, and first it seemed maybe things would pass in a few weeks, maybe a few months, and then here we are um, so many months later. So I was looking back um, to see some of our early coverage from, from CNN. Um, and actually, we had an interesting situation because our colleagues in Hong Kong uh, had a lockdown much sooner than our colleagues anywhere else. But also, um, and I looked at it, it was uh, February of 2020, um, one of our correspondents uh, was in Wuhan. And it was an interesting moment for journalists because um, suddenly the information that we were sharing, the stories that we were telling, was more important than ever to a bigger audience than ever. So our first story out of, out of Wuhan, um, I looked at it today, it had 200 million views. Um, and really that was about everybody in the world wanted to know what is this thing? What can I expect? What is it gonna mean for myself and my family? And one of the things that I think is so interesting and important about the moment that we're in right now and the opportunity that the Outriders team have given us to be together, it's something we were talking about last night, is yes, it was a global pandemic, it is a global pandemic, but everyone's experience differed so much depending on where you were. And so it's interesting because looking back now, I see, you know, for us as a global network, we use terms like, you know, lockdown, like quarantine. That you never used before, maybe. Right. But you know what? They mean something different basically everywhere. Uh, you shared earlier, Lola, that you were under this long lockdown, you know, and you had the, the chicken and, you know. Um, and in the U.S., we had lockdowns, but the lockdowns were um, certain businesses couldn't open certain restaurants you couldn't eat inside. Um, but for some places, the lockdown, it, you know, I mean, it, it had a much smaller, like, actual effect than, for example, here in Poland. Um, so it's, it's really interesting to have that moment again to be able to see for ourselves what happened, what we've all been through. You mentioned that CNN had some reporters in Wuhan. Uh, what were the main challenges for them? Maybe to go to inside the hospitals, I know that it was difficult. How was uh, the, that first moment for these reporters that suddenly they are in the middle of a pandemic, in the place where everything started? 
Yeah, so it's interesting. The, the story that I was mentioning, the one that had a bunch of views, um, we, we, we told that story in a bit of a non-traditional form. So, uh, you know, S CNN, obviously, <laughs> big formal TV network, and part of the storytelling for that particular piece was more, um, like, experiential. So, our correspondent showed, you know, with his cell phone camera, like, this is what it's like to try to get the ticket, this is the challenge here, this is the challenge there. Um, and, of course, you know, for us globally, the reporting experiences are very different depending on where you are. Um, and we saw, we've seen that as the pandemic has evolved. So, for instance, in the United States, um, the U.S. Uh, had a, you know, we've never, we've never really stopped community spread in much of the United States. So, um, you know, 600,000 Americans died in the pandemic. And we, in the U.S., had access to hospitals, but in the U.S., the, the framework for what we're able to show legally is quite different than, for instance, the framework in India, where there was recently a huge spike. And so, um, one of the things that a global audience would have seen differently is when you were seeing our coverage from the U.S., we were allowed to gain access to hospitals to show our audience what was happening in those hospitals. But you saw almost no patient faces. You saw, you know, anything that was identifiable, like a, like a bracelet would have been blurred out. And part of that is because in the U.S., a lot of people um, were getting treatment and even dying from the virus without being able to see their families. They were only able to see their families via, via phone. It was a completely different situation, for instance, in Brazil or in India, where when we had access to these facilities, there were family members who could say, yes, please show my, my loved one in this, in this situation because we want the world to see how bad things are right now. I would like to ask you about it. Uh, what was the most challenging ethical moment at that time? Because you need to decide, okay, we need to give this information because uh, we are a media, we need to inform about it, but we don't want to create more pain for the families. Yeah. There was a moment that you didn't know well, what you should do as a media and as a journalist. Yeah, so... So my, my job at, at the network um, is really thinking through some of these ethical questions. Um, we are maybe legally allowed to do something, but should we? Um, and so, you know, there were so many situations during the pandemic, and the pandemic continues. You know, the pandemic will continue until it's, you know, eradicated, the virus is eradicated globally. So, um, uh, there were so many issues where, you know, for instance, in Mexico City, we had access to um, ambulances. And in Mexico City, the ambulance drivers didn't have proper masks. They didn't have the masks they needed. They didn't, they didn't have the masks they needed. They didn't have um, proper protective equipment. And so these ambulance drivers were trying to save the lives of, you know, their fellow citizens, and they were taking great risks themselves. And so, you know, we had a big call about, okay, there's, it's important for our audience to understand this reality about what's happening in Mexico City, but then when they're going on an ambulance ride, they're picking up someone who is in grave need, and we don't want to intrude on that private moment for that family. Um, it makes me kind of emotional thinking about it because, um, you know, so often, for instance, conflict reporters, people who are covering a war, often they're leaving the war behind. They go, they cover the war, and then they go home. And this pandemic was such an unusual time where every journalist was covering the pandemic and living the pandemic too. Losing loved ones, missing family from abroad, 
And it was just, I've never experienced anything like it. My hope uh, is that it allows for um, more empathy, uh, both for news consumers and for journalists. Um, but it was, uh, there were so many very difficult conversations like that because there were, the, the need to show people what was happening, there were so many governments around the world that tried to say it's not so bad when really it was very bad. Um, so the need for people to understand it versus protecting people's privacy, I mean, there were a lot of very challenging conversations. And how is the current situation? Because I know that many people were vaccinated. Uh, I think some of the journalists already came back to the office. How is the current situation in the U.S.? Yeah, so the U.S. is, um, it, it feels like a completely different situation in the U.S. right now. Um, we um, have vaccinated just over half um, have received two doses. It's like 54%. In the U.S. now, if you're 12 and over, you can be vaccinated. So it's about 54%. Um, it's short of what is, is needed and hoped for. I, I think Poland is right about 34% vaccinated. Um, so you guys are doing a great job, too. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been a really big change in the U.S., but there is this new challenge um, for, for journalism, which is uh, the misinformation, disinformation around vaccines. Um, and so that is, that is sort of the, the new challenge in, in the US. Yeah, it's very interesting because during the pandemic, there was another president, uh, it was Trump. Uh, there were some media that at the beginning even they published that, well, this is not so important. Uh, how was for, a big media to inform about something that even at the beginning, you don't know what is going to happen. Yeah, um, you know, it's interesting because, so from a, from a public, public health, right, um, there's, a, there's a, one simple rule in public health, which is that you want to communicate very clearly what the rules are. The rules should be very simple. Um, so for instance, if you've ever been to Australia, um, Australia has a big problem with skin cancer. Um, it has a, a hole, it used to have a hole in the ozone right over Australia, and even still the rays are very strong. So they have a campaign called Slip Slap Slop. Uh, and it's like slip on the sunscreen, slap on a hat, and it's very, it's very Australian. But the point is it's memorable and people, people know this is the public health message. So, for instance, in the U.S., from the beginning, the public health message was very confused. First it was, don't wear masks. But really what they meant was, we don't have enough masks. So you really shouldn't wear masks because public health workers and the science around transmission was still kind of new. And so, you know, throughout the pandemic, um, for, for journalism, you know, one of the bedrock fundamental rules of journalism is attribution, right? Who said what? And so for us, the most important thing throughout the pandemic in terms of that, because the science is going to change. It's a new, it's a new virus. Humanity has never been through something exactly like this. And so for us, attribution has been the most important. You know, this is what the WHO says. This is what the top scientists in the US say. This is what President Trump said at the time. This is what President Biden says now. So that attribution is really, really important because it's, it's credibility. I mean, credibility is, is everything. Uh, we read that uh, for July 4th, President Biden uh, set a goal that they wanted that 70% of the adults were vaccinated. Uh, right now, many people were vaccinated, but it still is far for this uh, percentage. Why do you think uh, they couldn't reach this number? Yeah, so um, it's a complicated question. Um, and I don't know, I'm curious, for, for y'all who, there's a lot, of, a lot of Polish folks here, right? 
Do you sense in Poland, are people, are people nervous or anxious about getting the vaccine? Have you seen? Yes? Yeah? What's the reason why are you hearing? Yeah. There is a microphone there, please. Hi, thank you. Hi. <laughs> that sounds very weird. Um, so I guess the biggest thing is I, in the beginning it was like, it's not tested well, why we should do it, it's like an experiment, no one knows what will happen. Um, yeah, and then there was this uh, things with autism and because of vaccines cause autism and with the blood clocks with AstraZeneca. Um, so it kind of like grew into like a whole suspicion of is it even safe to do so? And then it's said that it should be, um, well, that it most probably we will have to be vaccinated in some time soon, those who already got the vaccines. So it's other like people like, yes, yeah, so what's the point? I mean, I'm not going anywhere, I'm not doing anything, I'm not, you know, going in a party, so maybe I don't have to do so. So I guess like from those uh, very small everyday fears, it grew kind of into the conspiracy theories with like chips, Bill Gates and like so on and so forth. I mean, I'm not saying that all the society is believing in that, but uh, I guess it's kind of like widespread and everyone heard of someone who's like maybe not denying the vaccine, like, I mean, but is being kind of suspicious, especially, you know, against AstraZeneca. Yeah, thank you for that. It's, it's very similar, very similar in the US and I think some of it, I think, is kind of natural. It's a new vaccine. Um, you know, it hasn't been, like, just like the virus, the vaccine hasn't been around that long. Um, it's, it's interesting because in the US, there's different groups who may have different sort of uh, hesitancies. Um, and there is, there is a factor that doesn't get, it's, it's, hard to, it's hard to counter, I think, which is kind of the, the local influencers, right? Whether they're on social media or in real life who may, who may sort of share some doubts. And the thing that's really interesting is in the US, the thing that works the best actually in countering those doubts is a relationship with your doctor. If you have a trusting relationship with your primary care doctor, then you go to the doctor and you say, hey doc, I'm hearing, you know, X, Y, and Z. And then the doctor says, it's okay, you know, and then you have that trust. But one of the things the pandemic really illustrated was the strengths and weaknesses of different healthcare systems. And so in the US, a lot of people don't actually have a good relationship with a primary care doctor. So there is definitely um, similar misinformation, disinformation in the US around the vaccines. Um, it's funny, maybe you've seen some of this, but as people are trying to get more and more people vaccinated, like Ohio offered a lottery. Saw, you saw and that? Free beer. Free beer. <laughs> free burgers. Uh, baseball tickets, a million dollars maybe uh, in Ohio. And does it work? <laughs> yes, actually it does. Um, because it's, you know, somebody may not think about it too much. You know, it just may not be... Free beer and a vaccine. Right, right, exactly. Probably no AstraZeneca. Exactly. But I have to say, um, I got vaccinated in March, and for me personally, it was just such a relief um, to, have that, to have that protection. And, you know, I mean, now, of course, there's the issue of inequality. The people who have access to the vaccine, the people that don't. I would like to ask you about that because it's true that we see in some countries in the United States, in Europe, that more and more people are vaccinated. But if you look at the countries, the low income countries, I think it's 0.9% of the population are vaccinated. Uh, what about inequalities we saw in, in US at the beginning? There was a pattern of people who didn't get access to the hospitals and today that they don't get the vaccines. Uh, there is this kind of... Uh, inequalities, differences? It, it can depend. It really is so variable. And, and that's kind of what I was saying about everybody has experienced a pandemic differently. 
Uh, so for instance, um, I went and visited my aunt who lives in Texas, um, a town of 500 people, and her county um, had a clinic right there for vaccines. But you had to drive to that county, you know, so there always are these, these, these limitations. Maybe you don't have transportation, um, maybe there's not a clinic near you. A lot of people actually worried that the vaccine was going to cost them money in the U.S. when actually the vaccine is free. But that also points to a weakness in American healthcare because American healthcare is very expensive. Very expensive. And so there was some information about some bills that suddenly are, I don't know, um, a lot of money. Well, so, so, the, so the vaccine is totally free. Um, but there, there is, I think, I think there was some study recently, like some pretty substantial percentage of people who weren't getting it, either they were worried it was going to cost them money or they were worried they wouldn't be allowed to take off work if they got a reaction. So it was interesting because I was talking to, um, I was talking to one of the Outriders crew last night who was telling me his experience of being quarantined here in Poland. And he said, you know, the officials would come and take the test and they'd look in on you and all of these things. And similar in Hong Kong, our, our folks who were quarantined in Hong Kong, you know, they make sure you have what you need and these kinds of things. In the US, absolutely not the case. They might tell you, please quarantine, but nobody's coming to check to see if you are. And certainly nobody's bringing you a test, nobody's bringing you food. Uh, so I think the experience was very different and it showed very differently the relationship between citizens and the government in a whole lot of different countries. And I think, you know, we probably won't see the effects of that fully play out for, I don't know, another decade even. Someone from the audience uh, had to pass a quarantine. I know that Jakub there is. Uh, and how was it, Tomek? Uh, can you explain us? I think maybe police call you to know if you're at home. <coughs> yeah, I had uh, visiting policemen and, and I was completely closed for 14 days in one room only. But it was the autumn last year, so it was the beginning. Right now I think that there is no force to, to check everything. So they tried, but I think that right now there is no so many policemen and, and other people who can check everything. So you watched a lot of Netflix or what? <laughs> no, <laughs> I didn't have one. <laughs> oh, that's brutal, brutal. I think Tadeusz is there, he explained us yesterday, but, uh, and what about the vaccine? Because I think the method is different in the US than in other countries. Uh, how do you get an appointment? Do you have an application? Do you choose the place? How does it work? So, um, I, know, I know in your, so for you, you're in Spain, and you, it's still age-related in Spain, right? So we need to wait. Uh, yeah, in Spain it's different, the system, because uh, it's just for some age. So for instance, right now they are vaccinating people who are older than 40 years, from 40 to 50. Uh, the first week of July would be from 30 to 39. And yeah, I'm still waiting, so I'm still young. <laughs> Yeah, so for us, we had a similar system, and now it's just open, uh, and so you can get it in a bunch of different places. Uh, I went to a Walmart, uh, so a very American experience. I went to a Walmart, uh, and I got my vaccine there, uh, and, um, and then I got a little uh, WHO vaccine passport uh, for, my, for my travel here. Um, to prove that I, I did indeed get vaccinated. But these days in the US, it's very easy to get an appointment. Super easy to get an appointment. In the early days, no. But, um, but, but it, it's, it's, a, it's been a very different experience this year so far with the pandemic for us. And right now, everyone can get vaccinated, even children, or there is an age? Yeah, 12, from the yeah. age 12 and up, yeah. 